So let's look at the lesson. It's Luke chapter 10. We're going to, it's a long passage, uh, 24 verses. It's always a boost when right before you stand up, your wife looks at the outline and says, this is a long outline. <laughs> But it's a long passage, Uh, but it's one with a a united theme, a theme that uh, cannot recklessly be considered the theme of the entire Bible, Uh, the wonderful salvation of sinners, which has been the object of all history because it is the intent of the triune God who is the author of history. God is establishing a kingdom with citizens, uh, hand-picked Uh, prepared and outfitted by him. The king of the kingdom is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal uh, son of God, second person of the Trinity, and he is the dominant figure of the Bible from the beginning to the end. And our passage today, I want to emphasize this at the beginning, offers us a slice of that, and it builds on what just came uh, before. I know it's been a long time since we examined uh, what just came uh, before, but I'm going to help you. It's been almost six uh, months, Uh, but for our purposes, we can summarize it succinctly by remembering uh, the profound thoughts found in three key verses from chapter 9. First, verse 51, and you can look there in chapter 9. Uh, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. He set his face like flint uh, to go meet with his appointed end in that city. I described it in January as eyes straight ahead. Uh, The overarching purpose of his incarnation was to culminate in dread fashion in that place, and he would not waver from entering into it. Verse 56 offers a reason. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus' mission was to be a Savior. And thirdly, in verse 62, there ensues the exhortation he gives to any who would become followers uh, of him and helping him execute uh, that mission described in figurative language as putting one's hand to the plow. No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're going to join in with Jesus in his great work of building a kingdom, there can be no looking back. You're plowing with the king. So let's read the passage, uh, beginning verse 1. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. I must say, you see it in the margin of your Bibles, there's some textual issues. Some manuscripts read 72, some 70. Uh, The reality is, I think it's a trivial uh, question, which one of those is the correct reading. So I'm just going to take it as 70 and we'll run Uh, with that. So verse 2, he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, but if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and uh, drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. 
Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted uh, to heaven. Jesus visited Capernaum a lot. Perhaps there was some pride had settled in on that city. You will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. The one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to, uh, to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. We had some storms a week or so ago, and uh, you, you either looking at your window or maybe in your car, uh, it's, it's, it takes your breath away, the, how quickly the lightning flashes, and it, it's, it's, it's scary. <clears throat> He said, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. That's a profound thing that the Son of God uh, incarnate rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. And he said, I promise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see and did not see them and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. So here we have uh, the fleshing out of this major theme of salvation and building a kingdom. Uh, first, if you, if you have an outline, you can see this. First in verses uh, 1 through 16 after the lessons he has just given in chapter 9 on the costs and demands of discipleships. He sends 70 select disciples out on a mission, that is, to put their hands to the plow with specific instructions and warnings for any who might reject their witness. Then in verses 17 through 20, uh, there are described the joyous results of their mission. In verses 21 through 22, Christ's pleasure in the way his Father sovereignly reveals spiritual truth and brings people into a relationship with him. And finally, in verses 23 through 24, we have a private word from Jesus intended only for his disciples regarding the profound blessing theirs is of knowing God's Son. There are many important things that a sovereign God brings into our lives, uh, family and op occupation, uh, challengings and testings, accomplishments and disappointments, but none can compare with his granting to us the knowledge of him and a place in his family and in his kingdom. Nothing can compare. So we have first the commissioning of the 70. Luke describes how the Lord appointed 70 others. That is, they are other than the 12 he had sent out in the previous chapter. He uses the same word of both events, apostello, indicating he was sending them on a mission. It's the word that we get our word apostle from. And as with the 12, 
He sent them out in pairs. There would have been at least two reasons for that. The, for one, the testimony they would give would have the necessary validity because of the number. It would not be just one man's opinion, but also it indicates that the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is not to be conducted in individual silos, but taking, uh, taken on in association with others whom the Lord commissions. Their purpose in going had to do with the sovereign Lord's determination to gather in a people for himself who would have the special privileges of knowing him, of having fellowship with him, and being citizens in his kingdom. And so in verse 2, he likes it, likens it figuratively to a harvest. Uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The people these witnesses would gather in would be characterized by repentance, by faith, and by following him. The privilege, he would say later in verse 22, of knowing God's Son. That's a key element that undergirds our passage, this great privilege of knowing him, knowing God's Son. Here then is the link between this section and the previous. Uh, note the opening verse. Now after this, after Jesus' commissioning of the 12 in chapter 9 and the Lord's subsequent lessons on the costs and demands of discipleship, we have this further mission. Part of being a, a follower, a disciple of Jesus, is serving the, him in bringing in his harvest. That's part of our mission. And, and that is putting one's hand to the plow, uh, desiring to be his laborers, his servants who bring in the harvest whom the Lord uses to bring his elect into the kingdom to know him and to have fellowship with him. What a labor uh, we're involved in, every one of us. It is a solemn and true mission, and one too that is often precarious. Uh, the Lord indicates that in verse 3 now. Uh, Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of of wolves, and that points to the danger one may encounter in serving the Lord, but also to our relative helplessness against the enemies of the Lord. We have to be entirely dependent upon Him. So Jesus gives the 70 some instructions beginning in verse 4, and they're almost identical to the ones he gave the 12 in chapter 9. I know you realize I'm going very fast, it's breathless but uh, it's 24 verses and we're going to get through them and not be too, too late. Well, we spent a, a, a bit of time discussing uh, those instructions when we studied that chapter 9, so I, I won't repeat the same things here, but the force of the restrictions is to emphasize the absolute necessity of faith in God to provide for them in the task ahead and also the urgency of God's work. It's not necessary <clears throat> to wait to serve the Lord until you believe you have everything you need or are adequately prepared. They are to take what little they have and the rest will be provided. There, there's a lesson here for almost every one of us, no matter our age. It is a hazard of the Christian experience that those who genuinely want to follow after Jesus so often believe they're not ready. They're just not ready. Uh, we're always waiting until we're more prepared or we're better trained or the time is right or until there is no one else who can possibly perform uh, the ministry, which of course seldom happens, you know, because there are often others who are not the least bit reluctant uh, to jump in at the drop of a hat. So, but most of us need some encouragement, like jump in, the water's fine. Pretty much is. Sometimes not so much, but 
And in doing that, the Lord would provide for them. That's the gist of his message to them in verses 5 through 7. One, one thing again, this church has been characterized by people jumping in. Uh, over the years. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And it's been characterized by people going, I can't do it. I'm not ready to do it. But jumping in and, and doing it and the Lord strengthening them and gifting them to do it. So the Lord's going to provide. Uh, that's the gist of his message to them in verses 5 through 7. This is to be the disciples' <clears throat> approach on this mission. He is alluding uh, to the ancient Near Eastern customs of hospitality. Uh, God would provide for the disciples even through the hospitality of strangers. Uh, this was a different age than ours. We know that, a world in which there were strict mores and manners regarding hospitality. And uh, so the disciples were to accept such graciousness uh, graciously. Uh, as if coming directly from God. Uh, they were not to shop around for the best deal, uh, but were to stay with those who took them in until they left for a different town. All three of the other gospel writers include some version of this practice of uh, the Lord. Um, and this theme is common to them all. Christ's servants should not seek support from unbelievers but trust God completely to supply their needs through his people, through the church. All the gospels proclaim that. But specifically for this mission, the disciples were to first determine what sort of household they were entering, accomplished by a kind of peace greeting. You can see that there in verse 5. They were to enter and announce, peace be to this house. It was common to invoke shalom. Uh, we don't do that, but they did and still do today, Jewish people, invoke shalom or peace upon greeting another. But in this case, considering the kingdom mission they were upon, the greeting more likely had the sense of an inquiry, meaning, is this a house of peace? And Jesus was saying, that the answer would determine what happened next. Is this a, a, a house of peace? Let's hear the answer. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. In other words, uh, one would be free to take their peace back and, and move on to a, another house. Their gracious greeting demanded a welcoming response. But then in verse 7, the, the focus shifts to the anticipated occasions when the disciples will have been received in such peace. What was to be their approach then when they were welcome? Well, for one thing, they were to feel free to receive from their hand the hospitality they offered. That was a ancient principle going back for centuries. It was a component of the Mosaic law. The laborer is worthy of his wages. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, 25 verse 4 instructed, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. And then the Apostle Paul, you know, took up that same uh, model. So these 70s, these 70 should have no compunction at accepting the good gifts others of like mind and faith proffered them as they are, in fact, the offerings of gratitude and obedience to God. And they, in turn, ought not fall in love with the giver's largesse and substitute for their own service to the Lord a searching for the most lucrative place to carry out their duties. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, uh, scandals of uh, the organized Christian church, uh, finding a better deal. And then he, he broadens his instruction uh, to the individual cities in verse 8. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set 
be for you. We're not told the specific uh, geography involved in the 70s uh, mission, but it would have almost certainly included uh, cities beyond the Jordan where there was a significant Gentile population and much as Paul would later uh, with the church in Corinth, uh, mainly Gentile Corinth, Jesus was encouraging them not to get sidetracked by dietary issues, but instead considering the magnitude of the task, disregard those scruples and focus on the main thing, the main thing. Uh, heal those in that city who are sick, this is verse nine now, uh, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The kingdom was the thing, not foods, it was the kingdom. Not trivial issues like dietary restrictions and the miraculous works uh, done by Jesus or done in his power by his followers were intended to reinforce that dramatic reality. And that's evident here. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God has come near. And it's evident a bit later in chapter 11, just across the page in my Bible, verse 20, chapter 11, verse 20 where Jesus had been uh, performing, he's, he's been performing a different kind of miraculous work, the, the, the casting out of demons, and he makes the same logical point. If I'm casting out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come near you. That's the important thing, the kingdom. It's the work he is commissioning the 70 to perform, announcing its arrival. So this was a, a kind of itinerant mission uh, the Lord was sending them on in which they would move from city uh, to city. And in verses 10 through 16, he uh, addresses the consequences for those cities that hear the message of the kingdom but reject it and don't welcome the messengers. Uh, the, the Lord had issued similar warnings uh, previously when he had sent out the 12 in verse 5 of chapter 9. Uh, when a city rejected them, they were to go out from the city and shake the dust off their feet. Oh, those of us who read the Bible or not, we're familiar with that phrase, shake the dust uh, off your feet as a, a testimony against them. And so he repeats that uh, here. It was a kind of acted parable. Uh, targeting them, illustrating that the city's rejection of Christ's disciples marked them out as of a different status, a, a different category of people in God's eyes and in their eyes. They had proven by their rejection that they had nothing in common with God's people. That was the reality. Uh, God's people were kingdom people. The city's unbelief did not alter that. And so, as verse 11 indicates, Jesus insists, be sure of this, he says, the kingdom of God has come near. He didn't want them to miss, even though they rejected it, he didn't want them to miss that very important fact. And I want you to notice the slight change in language from when they had come into the city in verse 9 compared to afterward, going in, they had said the kingdom of God has come near to you, <coughs> but now the kingdom of God has still come near, just obviously not to you. Well, there were in that day uh, well-known ancient cities that were emblematic of this kind of spiritual rejection. In verse 12, uh, Jesus chooses to make a parallel to uh, Sodom. Uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were renowned then, as they still are today, for their exceedingly grave sinfulness and, and wicked spiritual conditions. Remember in Abraham and Lot's day, as recorded in Genesis 19, the Lord rained down uh, brimstone and, and fire out of heaven, utterly destroying these two cities, Sodom 
and, and Gomorrah. Yet now he gives notice that even Sodom uh, will fare better in comparison to these unbelieving cities in, in his day that rejected Jesus' offer of the kingdom. And it goes further still, the cities in these days, the contemporary cities <clears throat> in, in the contemporary world when Jesus and his followers were spreading the word about this kingdom, uh, they were consequently, the, 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 those cities were consequently advantaged over those ancient cities. And Jesus suggests now in vivid language that a day is coming. He calls it that day in verse 12. A day is coming when God's judgment against the ancient cities of Tyre and Sidon will be more tolerable than for the ones rejecting Jesus and his word at that moment. And he mentions specifically Chorazin and Bethsaida in comparison to Tyre and Sidon. They were present-day cities. They don't get a lot of attention in the, in the Gospels, but they were cities where Jesus had ministered. And Tyre and Sidon were Phoenician cities of old, situated on the great sea to the north, which had attracted the Lord's uh, scorn through the prophets for their sins and in spiritual pride. Yet both of them would have repented long before, he says, sitting in sackcloth and ashes had they had the same privileges as these cities. And you, Capernaum, he continues in verse 15, will not be exalted to heaven, but will be brought down to Hades. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Capernaum uh, was a very familiar city uh, with uh, Jesus. It appears throughout uh, the Gospels. It was the equivalent of Jesus' own hometown. Uh, Matthew 9-11 uh, describes it as Christ's own city. He spent considerable time in, in Capernaum. Uh, so this was personal to the Lord. And his language, if you look there, uh, might reflect an allusion to that well-known passage in Isaiah 14, in which the king of Babylon, uh, standing figuratively probably for uh, Lucifer, the fallen angel, issues his famous I wills. I, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly. I will make myself like the most high. But the Lord rebukes him there uh, in Isaiah, insisting instead that he'll be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Jesus says a comparable thing uh, here in different words, you'll be brought down to Hades. This is overpoweringly condemning language. The fires of hell await those who reject the 70s message, and that's emphasized by the Lord's woes directed to them. Woe, W-O-E, not woe, W-H-O-A. It's em emphasized by his woes directed to them. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Now for us, and for most people, that word woe is what we sometimes think of as a, a biblical uh, term. Yeah, it's one of those words in the Bible, uh, not the kind of observation or criticism that, that we today would typically uh, launch against another. We know that it's bad, uh, but we probably don't understand the word woe well enough to know just how bad. Well, Eric Alexander helped me to understand its true meaning. Uh, he has a sermon on Isaiah chapter 6 entitled, Whom Shall I Send? And in it, he examined Isaiah's entrance. We all know this passage so well, Isaiah 6. He examined Isaiah's entrance into the presence of God, a lofty, and exalted, and sitting on a throne with the seraphim crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The, the whole world is full of his glory. And as the temple there in, in Isaiah 6 filled uh, with smoke, Isaiah instinctively cried out himself, woe is me. 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In the Bible, a woe is not a thing like a curse you might wish upon someone else. It is a horrifying reflection of what is already true about a person. Isaiah wasn't expressing what he might become or what someone might do to him. He was declaring who he realized he was. Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. You remember when we studied the Beatitudes out of, chapter, out of Matthew 5, also out of Luke, but blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, etc. Uh, we made the point then that the word blessed is not so much a wish that someone might be happy, but a comment on their condition on account of what God had done in their heart. Remember, you're blessed because of the condition you're in because of what God has done in, in, your, in your heart. Uh, they're poor in spirit and they mourn and they're meek because God had intervened in their hearts to make them that way. And because of that, they were blessed. They were blessed. Well, here these woes are the opposite of the blesseds in the Beatitudes. They are an observation upon the woeful condition they are in because of their sin and because of their obstinate hearts. God has pronounced woe against them. They had rejected his kingdom, proving they had nothing in common with it, and their, therefore Christ's evaluation of them is nothing but woe. Woe. Well, that should be reflected artfully in our own witness uh, for the gospel. Uh, not a kind of eager condemnation of unbelieving acquaintances, but at least a sense of sadness over what we know about their condition. And, and that's the gist now of verse 16, verse 16. The one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Our unbelieving friends and acquaintances are not rejecting us. They are rejecting God in heaven. And consequently, they're in great peril. And now we have a, a break in the account beginning in verse 17 between the commissioning of the 70 and their joyous return. They had had an amazing adventure, as it turns out, meeting with much success and leading them to return to the Lord with joy in their hearts. We're given only a brief summary of their report, the only real detail given being their surprise over the commanding power the Spirit of God had given them over the demonic realm. Even the demons are subject to us, they say, in your name. But it was no surprise to the Lord while the 70 had been out striking down the regulars, we might say. Jesus had overseen the fall of their commander. He said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning, uh, wielding his power over Satan. The devil's fall was instantaneous, like lightning which burst out of the sky in the blink of an eye. His demise was sudden and irreversible. The same authority Jesus had given uh, to them, the scorpions and serpents of verse 19 are figurative terms for the demonic powers they had in, encountered. The 70s master held authority over them all and had delegated that authority to them. But that was all just the window dressing of Satan's futile opposition. Nothing could withstand the most important thing the divine intent to secure the eternal blessing of all who are his indicated in the Lord's own conclusion in verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Our names are recorded in heaven. God's ledger has my name uh, written in it, in blood we might say. 
your name is written in heaven. Your name is written in heaven. The names of every soul ever born in the history of mankind who has been given by the Father in eternity past to his Son by divine election and then personally purchased by him with his shed blood on the cross. At the end of time, none will be lost. None will be lost. At the, at, 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 as the Apostle John saw it in Revelation uh, 21, as he looked upon the new Jerusalem, there was no one there tainted by sin, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Power over demonic forces is something of a headline grabber, yet it is the kind of thing that ends when earthly life ends, but to be deemed just before God, resulting in eternal salvation that never, never ends. Well, from start to finish, this kingdom uh, blessing belongs to those uh, brought in in this harvest solely on account of divine provision, divine illumination, and divine enablement. And now in verses 21 and 22, God's Son seems caught up in the wonder of it all. Luke writes that at that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. He rejoiced greatly, Jesus did. He rejoiced greatly. Leon Morris observed that that is far too colorless a translation for a word Luke used. His spirit, Jesus' spirit, literally filled with joy. It thrilled with joy. What was it that overcame him in that way. He was thrilled with joy. Well, this is amazing because this is it. It was the selective and discriminating way in which his father was bringing in the harvest so that the glory would belong to him alone. He said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. God hates pride. He hates conceit. James 4, 6 says, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. It's not that the Lord, this is important, it's not that the Lord rejoices over those to whom these kingdom truths are hidden. Rather, it's that they are revealed to those who humanly speaking, could not have expected it. People like us, none of us deserve the blessings that have been bestowed on us. You know me, I know you, none of us deserve these blessings. We are the recipients of unmerited favor and should rightly stand in awe at the thought. And I think in some sense we can say that is what overcame the Lord at that moment, in his humanity, he was in awe. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your son. Well, that idea, as we conclude, uh, that idea of this kingdom building, uh, this salvation of undeserving sinners springing entirely out of the free will of God is reinforced in verse 22 as Jesus now marvels at this salvific work from a different angle, the relationship he has as a son to his father. All things have been handed over to me by my father. And the significance of that is that no one knows who the son is except the father and who the father is except the son and anyone to whom the son wills to reveal him. So here are these profound truths stacked one upon another. God has God the Father has given to the Son all things, all things. Did that inspire uh, Paul in Colossians 1.16 to write this ode to the Son? By him all things uh, are, have been created. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Both Father and Son 
know one another fully and completely, but no one can even know who the Father and the Son are except Jesus Christ, God's Son, wills to reveal it. This salvation, uh, which has been the theme of these verses, is entirely of the Lord and of Him alone. Do you know Jesus? If you know Jesus, it's because God has given that knowledge to you as a gift. And then lastly, uh, this, uh, the 70 depart, only the 12 remain uh, in verse 23. And here is this private word directed to them alone. And it's again, the Lord wishes to reinforce to them just how blessed they are to be in on this great revelation over the span of centuries. Uh, many kings, many prophets uh, long to see these things and to hear these things, but did not. But they have. They have. What a blessing. Nothing can compare to it. Earlier, when the twelve had been asked by the Lord if they wanted to go away from him, do you want to go away too? Peter answered for them. So where are we going to go? You have words of eternal life. Their path to becoming the disciples, the apostles, Jesus intended them to be would prove to be tortuously twisted and anything but instant. Yet they would emerge after Christ's resurrection as the most powerful harvesters of the ripe fields of humanity gathering into his kingdom all those whose names had been recorded in heaven right to this very day where you and I now stand in him having believed the word of the apostles of the 12. The 59th question of the Heidelberg Confession reads, but what doth it profit thee now that thou believest all this? Answer, that I am righteous in Christ before God and an heir of eternal life. We are heirs of eternal life and all the praise belongs to our merciful God and we join our, the Son, our Savior, in standing in awe of that. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord, for this great word about salvation and about your kingdom and about your sovereignty in it. Uh, may we uh, live lives of gratitude and thanksgiving, uh, uh, reflecting upon our status before you in this state of all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.